consultant Dr Julian Humphrey. I always fancied a job where the weather was nice and there was a beach. In the end, it was Barnsley. Hello, Barnsley, any? Yeah. So we've got a 52-year-old male and stay COPD in respiratory failure. What should you here, please? Ten minutes. Thank you. You can fetch him straight into resource. We'll see you there. Come on, Dr Humphreys. It's me and Lee. <laughs> Leading today's resuscitation team is Dr Julian Humphrey. Are you going to be all right with no glasses on? I've got my contact lenses on oh. now. Unfortunately, I can see you. <laughs> yeah. We feed off each other, I think, in terms of um, the, the comical em element of what we do. And we, uh, we don't take our job too seriously. I think that's probably what it is. But when we have to, you know, we're on the ball. Paramedics bring 52-year-old Andrew straight to resus. Hello, young man. Andrew, I'm just going to get you onto this trolley. You're in the hospital. Oh, Can you shuffle across? Yeah, ready, ready. It's like... Oh. Oh. I'm going to eat a sweet act. I'm going to hook you up to a load of machines. All right. right. Are we all right to get to your chest? Yeah. You're just going to take some blood. We'll have a little listen to your chest, all right, while we put all of these bits and pieces on, OK? Do you feel like you're struggling? Security matron's come out today. It's just a, a routine visit that she's come out for. Basically, she's uh, she's found him outside at bed, increased rest rate, uh, sat on or two at that time, 60%. Okay. Look at me, look at me. Right, I'm Dr. Humphrey, okay? How long have you been like this? A couple of days. Right. All right, bud. Have you had any shivers, sweats? Yeah. And are you bringing anything off, off your chest? Yeah, loads of, loads of stuff. What colour? Green. No blood? I have a little bit, yeah. I mean, a lot, a lot of pain. Yes, I can try and get rid of that for you once I get a little tube in. Yeah. You were a miner, were you? How many years were you down the pit? Seven years, right, okay. I presume you were a smoker as well, were you? Nice smoke. <laughs> it takes a lot to be a miner. To survive that and then be crippled by the effects of it, that's a very difficult situation to deal with. And that sometimes shows true in, in the strength of character that these patients have. Right, OK. Basically, they're just saying that your lungs are packed up and there's nothing that they can do about it. Exactly, yeah. Right, and in the end, your lungs will, will pack up and that'll be, that, that'll be it, won't it? That's exactly yeah. Right, OK. So we're really struggling to get a line in you, and you say that normally go for your feet. Well, I can't really see anything there, either. I'll try over here again. Right, I'm going to go this side, aren't you? I think they're all shot. Yeah. Totally shot. Hi, it's Julian Humphrey, one of the emergency medicine consultants. I've got a, uh, a little bit of an issue. I've got a gentleman who's come in, he's in his 50s, he has home oxygen. He sounds like he's um, sort of end-stage COPD. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give him a trial of um, non-invasive ventilation and see how he gets on. The other problem I've got with him is that um, I can't get any IV access. Yeah, all right. No problem, bye. I'm going to change this mask over. not going to be warm, is it? No, this one's a smaller one. All right. Let's have a go. Are you all right with your cannula going in this arm? If we can get one in this arm. I tend these days to try and 
imagine that that's my father sitting there or my mother or my sister. You don't block it out, you can't block it out. You mentally process it and then you come out the other side and you carry on. That's what you do. Yeah. We're not aiming for a cure here. Yeah. We're aiming for comfort and yeah. support. You've done really well. Thank you. We're done. You've done very well. You can have a round of applause. I'll leave you in peace now, Andrew. Hello. Hello. Hiya, is that Adrian? Speaking, love. Hiya. Are you uh, Andrew's uh, brother? I am, yeah. Hiya, I'm Benita. I'm one of the sisters in from Barnsley A&E. I've got your brother with us in hospital at the moment. Um, I was just ringing to let you know that he's not very well at the minute. Yeah, if you just come straight in, Lovey, I'll keep my eye out for you. All right, bye bye, bye bye. He's on his way, Lovey, for about half an hour, 40 minutes. I do see patients that are about my age who are dying prematurely. He's just been booked in. It reminds me of my own mortality, that's what it does. It's not one that um, we like, but it's, we, we have to face up to it. That's part of being a doctor. Right, OK, there's an ambulance coming in. It's two minutes away. 81-year-old uh, male, multiple fractures. He's fallen while taking his dogs out. Morning, I'm Dr. Humphrey. Ryan, you're not going to be walking around at the moment, are you? Yeah. So we're going to take you somewhere else. We're going to uh, put this ankle straight because right. uh, I don't like the colour of your foot. Okay. Right. Uh, and it's a little bit bent. What dog was you walking? Uh, Gig Joe in the shoot song. Right, okay. That reminds me of a joke. <laughs> which I will uh, <laughs> which I will tell later on. 81-year-old Brian is moved to recess for emergency treatment. I do find some things humorous. Um, I haven't got a, a, a darkly black sense of humor, but I think I can try and relax people with, you know, perhaps comments that will make them smile or, or laugh. Let's put the lights on. How on earth did you get back home? Uh, two police officers lifted me up. And took you home? Yeah, yeah. Took only across the road. All oh, right, OK. And where, where are the dogs? Yeah, one of them took it back to house. The dog took itself back to the no, house? No, one of the police officers. All oh, right, OK. Look at the colour of that foot compared to the other one. Yeah, so uh, I couldn't really feel the pulse in, that, in the top of that foot. I'm concerned that the foot hasn't got a good blood supply. It's looking a little bit mottled and cold. We need to correct that. One of the things we love about emergency medicine is actually doing a procedure that puts something that is clearly out of shape back into the right shape. Reductions of joints, fractures, anything that goes crunch. <laughs> um, have you pulled many ankles before? Right, OK. Yeah, so the first, first thing we want to do is grab hold of the, cal um, the calcaneum, the heel, and just pull it, all right? Pull it down, OK? That should disimpact it. Yeah, well, we're going to give them high flow and then just monitor CO2. Yeah. So this has got oxygen going in, OK? That's just going to sit underneath your nose. Chris is going to make you a little bit sleepy. While you're sleepy, we're going to be pulling your ankle straight. Right. When you come round, your, uh, your leg will be in a plaster, all right? All right. How much pain have you got at the moment? Not a lot, it's just tingly. Just tingly, yeah. right, OK. Have you got anything you want to ask me? No, no. OK. Oh. Who's putting the cannula in? So, Brian. Yep. I'm going to give you a couple of different medicines, OK? Right. The first one's going to make you feel a little bit strange. You might even see things. All right. <laughs> All right. Just relax. Go with it. All right? We'll wait till uh, he's nice and sleepy. All right, just try and keep your eyes open for me. Feeds away with the fairies at the moment. The 
hub is where staff are able to share what they've done last night. They can whinge about managers, whinge about their nursing colleagues, they can whinge about doctors. So it's a bit of a, of a barometer, an emotional barometer of the department. Julian, are you yes. looking forward to your holiday? Of course I'm looking forward to my holiday. Well, where are you going? Mallorca. Have you ever been there? Yes, once. Magaluf? No, I can't, I can't remember, no. <laughs> Have you been before? Yes, it's beautiful. beautiful. Lovely cycling, lots of cyclists, Taking quiet bike. roads, Three. nice food, good company, away from here, nice no stress. Relax. Yes. Oh, Recharging nice. my batteries. Even have my hair cut, ready. Yes, I just noticed. <laughs> So um, Julian is in resus uh, with that patient and uh, Jane is also in paediatrics at the moment with them so you've got the A team on in relation to that so we should be okay. In resus bay three, Brian's sedative has taken effect. Right, let's take that out first. That's it. Just bring this up a little bit. Yep. Okay. So if you grab hold of the foot, you can give it a good pull, pull, pull. That's it. See what I mean? Right. Okay. A bit, a bit more traction. That's it. Good. Okay. Now, a lot of the time, they, the junior doctors will be fighting to do it. And the other thing is, they need experience in doing these things. People will come and watch. If they hear that something is going on, they, you know, you'll get the odd. Ooh. You feel that pulse now. Just move the ankle up and down now, just to see what sort of movement you've got there. When Claire puts the plaster on now, we're going to be putting it back into that position, OK? Need, OK, so just relax. Yeah. So just relax now, hold, hold it here. So you can see why, why this needed reducing, so the blood supply's going straight back into the foot, isn't it? Yep. And then we can manipulate it again afterwards, just gently. That's the reason for doing this straight away, rather than sending him around for an X-ray just to restore the blood supply. Very good. And that's how you do it, essentially. OK. How are you feeling? OK. Do you remember any of that? Right, being in his face. <laughs> <laughs> Job's all done. Right. All right, so you just sit Thank back you. and relax, all right? Bless him. We tend to use ketamine in these situations. One of the problems with it is, though, that when patients start to come round after the procedure, they will hallucinate. It is quite entertaining, but, you know, you, you don't want to be laughing too, too much at it. I usually say, where's the money? Anything you want to ask? No. Nope. No, all right. Just uh, relax and have five minutes if you need it, OK? Right. And I'll see you Thank when you've you. had your X-ray done. Thank you. Friday morning, I'm off for a week. TG. <laughs> I'll be going skiing somewhere stupid where you can break another leg. Don't take him advice. Yeah. Well, every year, you fall off and you break somewhere, you have three months off work. Yeah, but I am the NHS secret shopper, did you not know? He's that? a secret shopper. He comes in and he tries all services to see what's what. Yeah. So he's fractured his ankle in three places. Fractured it there. There, both sides and at the back. Just explain that to him. <laughs> right, your ankle was fractured in three yeah, places. Yeah. Okay, and um, normally when that happens, you you don't get away with without an operation. So what will happen now is that one of the orthopaedic doctors will come and see you and right. arrange for you to go to the ward. You said you weren't in any pain, didn't you? No, no. It... You were walking a shit zoo. Did it pull you away then or something? Yeah, he went. Yes, yeah, and yeah. I tried to pull him back, but we were on a bit of a slope. Yeah, and down you went. And down I went. Anyway, have you ever been to Barnsley Zoo? No. But it's not a very good zoo. There's only one animal in it. It's a dog. Do you know what sort of dog it is? No. It's a shit zoo. Shit zoo. <laughs> <laughs> so, no okay. questions then. Right, you can book an orthopaedic bed. Right, Fine. good. Thank you. Dr Humphrey has reached the end of his shift. So Andrew gone? Yes, he's gone to CCU. What about his family? Did they turn up? Yeah, brother turned up. Um, 
was quite aware, I think, of how unwell he was. The poor man. There's not very much we can do about that down here except support him best we can. Yeah. Are you working a weekend? Uh, no, they don't want me. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, maybe doing Sunday back on Monday night. Okay. Right, I'm going to get on my bike and uh, try and process all that. I'm going out for a drink. Right, enjoy, as you normally do. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you when I see you. See you later. Thank you. Bye. Hello, Barnsley Emergency. Fewer staff means more work for lead consultant, Dr Julian Humphrey. It's his first shift back since his holiday. When you go to a Spanish island in late March, you expect a little bit of sunshine and you expect some <laughs> nice warm weather. What I was faced with is having to dress in gloves and a hat and longs. But I'm mentally recharged, ready for the next... Um, the spring pressures, not the winter pressures anymore. It's now spring, isn't it? We've been battered this winter in terms of how busy and how stressful the department's been. And you definitely need to just go away from that. It's recovery time. Hello, Barnsley Emergency Department. OK, female, 63-year-old, suspected heart attack. Yeah, here it comes now, look. Dr Humphrey moves to recess bay one to prep for the arrival of the patient. Angela is suffering with a suspected heart attack. Do you want to just sit up a little bit more, my love? We'll just, uh, we'll just lift you up a little bit. Yeah, we'll do it for you, my love. We'll do it for you. One, two, three. There you go. Yes, this is Angela. Angela's 63. No history of heart problems, just hypertension, cholesterol and kidney failure. Yeah. Um, two days ago, began with like a right-sided back pain. Right. Um, it's not gone away. Today, um, really severe, gone up into the neck, really clammy. We did think blood pressure was uh, 90 on air. So that's why we, we phoned up. We just the way that she got. She actually felt really, really unwell. Right. But Patients who come with, with heart attacks may not come with this classical public perception of them of clutching your chest and being drip white and sweaty and it's about not missing the the clues that you're being given have you got any pain at the moment it's still in my back still in your back yeah. what about if you breathe in is it worse no it's all right right does it feel very severe did it come on just like that bang well i've been in bed for two days right i need a nurse I'm here. Working alongside Dr. Humphrey in recess today is sister Amanda Calvert. Just sit yourself forward because I want to have a listen to the back of your chest. That's all right. Can I lift this up? Have any problems with your breathing, Angela? No. Okay. And have you been feverish the last few days? Shivery, hot? I've been shivering. You have been shivery? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you feel well in yourself? No. Another reason for suddenly becoming short of breath is a clot on the lung. Yeah. So we'll need to just check that over as well. See if we can find a vein then and we'll uh, start doing some blood tests. In recess bay one, Dr Humphrey and Sister Calvert are treating 63-year-old Angela, who arrived with chest pains. Try and get a bit more blood towards your head. Yeah. We'll see if that improves your blood pressure. Okay. Sharp scratch coming. Dr. Humphrey has ruled out a heart attack, but is unsure of the root cause of Angela's serious condition. So X-ray going to come around and do portable X-ray, and I'll take that and get it. I should. So antibiotics. And fluids. Let me know when that chest x-ray is done and I'll come and have a look. Yeah. You, you do have a second sense, this, this, this feeling, this sort of the hairs in the back of your neck go up a little bit. I think, oh, there's something not quite right here. The antibiotic I'm going to give you is a mixture of two different antibiotics. What's that for then? Well, I, we, with, we think that this back pain you're getting is a chest infection. All right. 
just couple that with the fact that your oxygen levels are a little bit low mm. and you don't have a diagnosed respiratory condition, upper back kind of pain more than likely is a chest infection. But we want the x-ray to confirm it. Being an emergency medicine doctor is all about problem solving. I'll ask you to breathe in and hold your breath, all right. We, we like the thrust and the, the adrenaline buzz of, of dealing with problems and potentially in the recess room, a lot of them can be life-saving or life-challenging, life-threatening problems. You just keep nice and still. Thank you. Yeah. I think it looks like there may be evidence of an infection there. Mm. Yeah. There's certainly something wrong with your chest. Yeah. Um, and that would fit with the levels of oxygen in your blood being a little bit low. Yeah. So I've given you some antibiotics. Right. We'll just wait until these other blood tests come back. Right. Um, and. Um, Obviously, I think you're going to need to come into hospital just really to, to get to the bottom of this, really, OK? Yeah. Right, I think my lady might be septic. That's what I think. And we'll uh, work on that basis, I think. Three hours after being admitted, Dr Humphrey has a diagnosis for Angela in recess bay one. And their bronchogram, so this is all consolidation here. It's mainly than the right lung. Yeah. yeah, and there's a you can't see the bottom. The bases are very blurred, and if you actually listen to her chest, she's it's quite dull down. There's hardly any air getting in. So, How come she's not coughing anything up? Because it's probably an atypical pneumonia. Maybe I don't know. It just shows you can be look quite well, but mm. it's all about experience and instinct, where you use your clinical experience to and your, your second sight and your, your, your intuition to actually make decisions. Sometimes I'm wrong, but, you know, more times I'm right than I'm wrong. So, your blood tests show that you've got a significant infection. It looks very much like it's a chest infection, a pneumonia. The blood tests are actually markedly raised for infection, so you'll definitely need to come into hospital I think I'm going to give you some um, stronger antibiotics than I've already given you. I think it's a good job that you came today, actually, because if, if you'd left it any longer, it could have been life-threatening, I think. Right. OK? Yeah. Did you know we were voted the number one department by F2 doctors in 2014. Yeah. It's a national survey of F2 doctors in training. The best department was Barnsley Emergency Department. Right, come through then. Dr. Humphrey's next patient is six year old Alex, who's waiting for treatment in Pediatric Bay 4. Are you Alex? Alexander, what do you like to be called? Alex. Alex, right, OK. And who have you brought with you today, Alex? Mum. Mum. Is she a nice mummy? Good. I do like dealing with children. I don't see very many children myself. I'm not quite sure what that is. You know, perhaps as I got older, I, I, they, they probably look at me and think, oh, my, you know, here comes my granddad to treat them. I think. How did you cut your eye open? I got hit by a golf club. A golf club? What are we going to do today? Swim. Yes. Uh, I'm gonna. And what's going to but what's going to happen while you're having a little sleep? Have dreams. So when you've had some dreams and you wake up, what's going to happen to that cut above your above your eye? It'll be gone. Well, it won't be gone, but it'll be a little. It'll have some stitches in it, won't it? It'll be fixed. It'll look a lot better. Have you got anything you want to ask me? No. Have you got anything you want to ask? I don't think so, thank right. you. Yeah. All clear? We're all right, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. And you've not had anything to eat this morning, have you? All right, and he's normally fit and well, isn't he? Yes. Yes. Good. Right, we'll get it all sorted out, don't worry. Thank you. Thank OK, you it's all yours, Marius. Right, let's get started then. Seven hours into his shift, Dr Humphrey is with six-year-old Alex in recess. Are you with us? He's been sedated so that his head can be stitched. I do view the situation from the parent's perspective, and I know that ketamine will give you this very odd appearance. Your child is going to look like the lights are on, 
and there's no one at home. Yeah, okay. Let's see what we what we like. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cover up this eye so I don't get anything into the eye. But what I'm gonna do first is give it a good clean, okay? If your child's eyes roll back and they look like they're not alive, you are going to be scared. In that situation, it's bring the parent to the child, reassure them, reassure them, reassure them. You okay, Mum? Yeah, he's doing really well. You can see this is quite deep. Right, so I'm going to put some local anaesthetic in. Now, this is your locking stitch. Now, I was that side, now I'm this side. Come back, grab that, and that's it. So what I want to avoid here is his eyebrow looking a bit weird. So this will look a lot better once we've done this. You will need to have the stitches taken out in about Five to seven days. Okay. Yeah, he's doing really well. So you will have a little bit of a Harry Potter scar, but um, oh, not. M <laughs> the eyebrow obviously will cover m the majority of it. Okay. Relax, fella. You're doing well. <sighs> Hello. You're coming round a little bit. Mm. Shall we take all this off then? There we go. Did you have some dreams? Yeah. What did you dream about? Dogs in the playground. Dogs in the playground? Mm. Wow. What sort of dogs? Big ones or small ones? Pugs. Pugs? <laughs> <laughs> the children when they're given ketamine, they often will have lovely dreams. They'll dream of fairies or whatever children are into these days. It's the adults that have the scary ones. All good? Are you happy to take him around to...? Yeah, he's I think sometimes Barnsley Emergency Department is like a war zone. <laughs> there's, uh, there's, sometimes there's patients everywhere, when, especially when it gets busy. Maria, you are right to do walking because wait's getting up to an hour. Surrounding the main hub are 30 bays to treat the emergency patients, including paediatrics. Should we have a quick look at you then, Chicken? The walk in assessment unit. Right then, Alan. Have you had an ECG done before? Lots of stickers. And resuscitation, where the most serious cases are treated. Meanwhile, Julian is suffering from a cold. <laughs> my nose is going to be red raw. I've got a box of tissues, so I'm going to put my name on it, actually. <laughs> I will get very little sympathy for man flu. Man up juice is probably going to be prescribed. Back in the hub, Dr. Humphrey has arrived to help assess and treat new emergencies. There's no trolleys. No trolleys. No, no trolleys. No space, so we can't have. No trolley, no space. So we're closing early and we're going shopping with our sisters, aren't we? <laughs> We've got no room to put anybody. Now the queue is into the community. Bounce ED. Yeah, is it medical or trauma? Dr. Humphrey has called to recess to assess 76 year old Cynthia, who is struggling to breathe. You're a little bit blue when you got here, I think. I don't think there's any worse symptom for a patient than actually feeling like you're gasping your last breath. Their brain's not working the rest of the body is crying out for oxygen and they become very sick very quickly unless you do something about it. 
Right, I'm Dr. Humphrey. You're Cynthia's other half. I was right, okay. And you brought her up with a bad chest. Very bad chest. Okay. Now, do you not... Know... Right, okay. So you've had a bad chest for about 20 years. Yes, I stopped smoking 20 years ago. Right. Now, how far can you walk normally without getting breathless before you became unwell? Probably 50 years because they have vascular disease as well. Right, okay. I've had nine operations on the legs. I can only get from the bedroom to the bathroom and then I'm out of breath. Right, this OK, week. that's this week. So your exercise tolerance has gone right down, hasn't it? You can't even walk within your house that's without right. getting breathless. Yeah. So have you had any problems with your heart, heart I attacks angina. or angina? I have angina. Right, but never a heart attack. Never, not OK, anymore. we'll need to take some blood from you and send you for a chest X-ray and things. Awesome. Let's have a little look at you, then. Just sit yourself forward. Let's have a listen to your back. Mine's a bit cold, I'm afraid. Yeah, it's not sounding very nice in there, very crackly. So what were you doing when you were working? Work mainly office work. Before we got married, I said worked in a paint spraying place, which I shouldn't have done. Right. Because it were chemicals, but we needed the money to get married. So it's what you did. Is this the first time that you've had a nasty infection in your chest that hasn't gone away with antibiotics? Yes. They did a heart tracing, didn't they, earlier on? OK. Yeah, you've not got a lot of oxygen going around in your blood. Let me just uh, get these blood tests sent off and we'll uh, get, start, get you started on some medicines, all right? In recess bay three, Dr Humphrey is still trying to get to the root of why Cynthia is so short of breath. So you've had a reaction to doxycycline in the past, according to your GP notes. Yes. And ampicillin and erythromycin. Your GP sent a sample of your spit to the lab, is that right? Yes, I took it down on Wednesday. Right, let's see if that's come back then. She's sensitive to several antibiotics. We know that amoxicillin's clearly not working, so we need to give her perhaps something slightly different. I've just checked and she's grown Haemophilus influenza in her sputum. Right, okay. From the sample that was sent by a GP and it's resistant to amoxicillin. Right, So that is why she's not got better. Right, the, the sample of spit that you sent, was sent to the lab by your family doctor yes. grew a bug, which has got a fancy name, uh, called oh. Haemophilus influenza, and it fights off amoxicillin. So now we know that you're on the wrong antibiotic, we can get you started on the right one. Oh, good sir. Okay. The reason you're in here is because when we've checked your blood pressure and your pulse and how much oxygen you've got in your blood, oh. It's not very, not it's, yeah, your, your, your physiology is not good. Well, I'm not going anywhere, do you? No, 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 I think you just need to just take it easy and let us uh, get on top of this infection for you, OK? Yeah. I think you're going to uh, need to be in hospital for a few days. Antibiotics, antibiotics, antibiotics. Coemoxiclav and chlorethromycin. Right. Hello, it's uh, Julian Humphrey Brown in uh, Rhesus. Can we have a portable chest X-ray on a lady called Cynthia Me Meginson? OK, thank you. Bye. Once that diagnosis, that scan is done and you see the result and the report comes back, you think, I've done it, yes, OK. Now the patient can get the treatment that they need. You've got some changes at the bottom of your lung on your X-ray. That suggests that you've got a pneumonia on the left-hand side at the bottom right. and probably a little bit on the right-hand side, all right. right? So it should, once you're on the right antibiotics, that should start yes. to clear up fairly quickly, okay. all right? That's fine. So um, I'm sure you'll be feeling a lot better within a couple of days. Thank all right. You. Anyway, she's getting better, isn't she? She is. Looking happier. <laughs> The team has treated a record-breaking 300 patients in the last 24 hours, thanks to years of training and experience. When I left school, I failed my A-levels, and I ended up washing up in a hospital kitchen until I went into the RAF and ended up being a, like a paramedic, really. But I did apply to medical school. So just rocked up one day. As a mature student, after having uh, 10 years in the RAF. 
Dr. Humphrey is going to see one last patient before he clocks off. In Bay 9, 56-year-old Glynn's heart is being monitored. He arrived with shooting pains in his chest. Hello, I'm Dr. Humphrey. Are you Glynn? So what's happened for you to come and see us today? What was the problem? Whereabouts was this pain? The, well, back of my head, and I'm sure, like, Burning sensation. Right, so it's Sweat. in your chest, but it's also yeah. in your throat. Yeah. And goes to the, your back as well a yeah. bit, does it? Yeah. Now, have you still got pain at the moment? Yeah. A lot? Not as much, but not as bad, though. Right, OK. Now, you have got a bit of a track record of having heart problems, haven't yeah. you? Because yeah. I can see some scars on your chest. Yeah. So tell me about what's happened to you in the past. What's happened to your heart? I passed out three times, and I died three times. Mm-hmm. Sorry? Cardiac so you've had three times where you had a cardiac arrest, your heart stopped and you've been yeah. resuscitated. Was that yeah. by the paramedics or in hospital? Uh, one at home. Yeah. One ambulance, one in hospital itself. Right, okay. Right, right in seconds. Now, are you smoking at all? Yeah, I lose my heart, don't I? Right, okay. And what about any heart problems in the family? My dad died at 57 heart attack. Have a heart attack. And you're in your right. 50s at... Yep, are you in your 50s yourself at the moment? Yes, I'm 56. You're 56, OK. Now, whatever you see or is put in front of you, you remain calm and you do the best you can with what's, what's in front of you. Um, because if you don't and you start to panic, what's the patient going to think? What do you do? What's, what do you do? What's your job? Stop feeling. Whereabouts? Iceland. Where's Iceland? Uh, Iceland, oh, right, yeah. okay. You not brought any chalk ices for us then? No, I'm melted. <laughs> and I'm not I'm not that part of the dry goods. In the dry goods? Biscuits, right, yeah. okay. Please. So you understand what's gonna happen? You're gonna need to have a chest x-ray. Yeah. A nurse is gonna come and give you some tablets and an injection, okay? Right, yeah. And uh, we'll get you admitted, all right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, thank you. I'm sure if I can have an update of the plan for this patient, please. Uh, right, OK, so uh, the Northern General um, are thinking about taking him. Um, he's the registrar's going to speak to his consultant. He's the same age as me. That's the kind of thing. He doesn't look as old as me, <laughs> <laughs> The 30 bays surrounding the hub are full of people needing treatment. And to add to the pressure, Emergencies keep arriving. We've had horrendous waits for beds, and it's because the hospital's full. Pushing the team to hit the four hour target are consultants Dr. Julian Humphrey and part time comedian Dr. Rob Jones. So, did you do any improv this weekend then, Rob? I must come and see you sometime, I really do. Please do, you're yeah, more yeah. than welcome. Do you get heckled? Um, like you do here. Not as bad as you. <laughs> Not as bad as you. <laughs> Dr. Julian Humphrey is called to the assessment bay to treat 90 year old Jack, who has symptoms of a heart attack. Did your daughter ring the doctors and tell them that yes. you'd been having chest pain? Yes. The chest pain that you've been having, when did you have it? Today or yesterday? Yeah, 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 yesterday. It was slightly yesterday. And does it feel like a pressure on your chest? That's it. Right. I've got off the side and yeah. laid on my back. Right. I laid on the other side because of pain. Now, to see if I could ease it. Were you a minor? That's the other thing yes. I need to know. Right, you yes. were a minor. OK. Yeah. Right, how many years were you down the pit? Going into 40 years. And did you get any compensation for your chest or anything like that? Uh, not, not for my back. Just for your back? Yeah, for my back. Right. You had an accident down the pit, did you? Yeah. We, we, see, a, we see a lot of minors. That ethic, that hard-working, you know, Yorkshire grit, I think comes across in, in the way that these patients talk to you or have this sort of very stoical attitude. This, this group, slowly but surely, are actually dwindling down now. Bubble cancer. As well? Right, you're a medical mi miracle, aren't you? Yeah, I, yeah. You're, you're a tribute to the NHS. I, I play for England at arms. Did you? And I play for the county. Right, how many layers of clothes have you got on there? I've got uh, a, a long sleeve t shirt. Right. And I've got a shirt. I need to get, just get to your heart, so I want to have a quick listen to it, if you don't mind. 
Right, well that scar's healed up quite nicely, hasn't it? Just relax, let me have a quick listen to your heart. Right. Now, this pain that you're getting, does it feel like it's across your chest, like a pressure? Yeah, just there, there. And does it... Right. About there, there. Does it hurt when I press on your <coughs> chest at all? Keep pressing. Right. With your heart being a little bit diseased, we're going to need to just check it over, OK? That's what your doctor wanted, I would imagine. We'll do another tracing of your heart, and we'll take some blood from you, OK? He's a character, isn't he? <laughs> I, I don't know if you saw, but he put his fist to his chest, and that's, that's one of the classic signs that it's, it's pressure there, and that's possibly from an angina-type pain. People in Barnsley are funny though. They are, they're, oh, they're so funny. They're a funny, they're funny, so funny. They're so population. dry and they can just, just take you out with one little <laughs> comment. I think I have a very Yorkshire sense of humour actually. Um, and the Yorkshire, you can, the Yorkshiremen are quite mocking of each other. But I haven't developed a Yorkshire accent. I don't think I've developed a Yorkshire accent anyway. <laughs> As Dr. Humphrey's shift nears its end, he's keen to get 90-year-old Jack home as soon as possible. Right, so uh, he's got triphasicular block on there, which is first-degree heart block plus left bundle branch block. Normally, patients who have that rhythm need a pacemaker, but um, he's not describing any syncopies. Right, young man. Why don't you come back and oh, sit down and I'll have a little chat with you. Are you watching the world go by, are you? Sorry, you can sit on that chair if you want. It definitely isn't your heart, all right? No. Really As I say, if it's not your heart, then it, what we call is, is not specific, so we don't know quite what it is. So we're going to let you go home, all right? I'm going in and have my daily paper to read okay. when, I get, when I get home. Yeah, and I'm just going to speak to the nurse and we'll get you up to the discharge lounge, yeah, all right? Sure. Right. Thank you very much. OK. Thank you. One of the things about minders, and in general, Barnsley people, is they're extremely respectful to doctors. Thank you for helping me. Thank you, doctor. That's one of the things that does make me proud to work in Barnsley, actually, that recognition of what you do. As Jack is discharged, the day shift ends for the team of Barnsley Casualty. This hospital is very, very, very good. The staff, the staff, you know, on... The amenities are, it's very good. I haven't got, you know, a, a, a millimetre of regret, no regret at all about choosing emergency medicine as a career. After eight weeks off with a fractured hip, Dr Humphrey is back in action. I heard about your hip. Yes, I'm all right. Well, I've got a fractured acetabulum and pubic rami, uh, but I'm all right. Well, you're walking, which is good. Yes, I'm walking, which is really good. <laughs> I have got to put my hands up. I am a bit accident prone. Came off my bike in uh, Sheffield. The next thing I did was I, I ruptured my Achilles tendon. I didn't quite see a bit of broken curb and pothole when it took my front wheel. Yes, I'm the NHS secret shopper, I think. Are you OK? It's so lovely to see you. <laughs> How yes, are you? I didn't recognise you. What happened to your hair? What's happened to your hair? Yes, well, I decided that I wanted to look younger than you. <laughs> Um, oh dear, this is where uh, things could get a bit messy. After two months off work, Dr Humphrey is attempting to get back into the swing of things. Any passwords well, yeah. well, normally my ICE password populates itself, but it hasn't done, so I can't remember it. <laughs> so I'm going to see if I can make it up. That's very bad. Why is it so bad? Yeah, there's 70 people in the department, and um, normally there'd be about 45, maybe. So nearly twice what you'd expect. With so many patients waiting to be seen, Dr Humphrey has to hit the ground running. Have you got that lady's note? Yeah. I just need to... Um, right. I've done the blood form. Do you want to come through? 
these type of um, uh, boils in the skin, they're not the sort that you'd want to put an, a knife to. Well, it's definitely treatable. OK, <laughs> that's the main thing. How long have you been off? Eight weeks. Have you? I caught up with Stranger Things. Have you ever watched that? That's really good. That's awesome. They're over there. All the staff are obviously very pleased to see me. I was very pleased to see them. And then the first patient, it was like getting back on your bike and riding it again. <laughs> I don't know if she's a yeah. shaft or necklace. Right. Next on the agenda, four-year-old George, who's damaged his finger. No, What's the matter? <laughs> What's your name? Said <laughs> George. <laughs> He's very wriggly. He is, and he bites and scratches. <laughs> George, George, let's get these bubbles. Oh, George, George, George. <laughs> There we are. That's not too bad. So we'll uh, we'll see him when we see him. He sounds like he's going to be a bit of a regular, doesn't he? <laughs> George, say bye-bye. Bye. Are you going to give me a high five? Oh, good, good boy. Thank you. You either um, go, in, go into fifth gear and just keep going. Yeah, first to fifth, and that's it, bang. I could just sit down in a quiet room and just get patients brought to me. That's what it was like when I first got here. And I would sit there and they and I would see them and about two hours into the shift, so a nurse would say, Oh, would you like a cup of tea, Doctor? You've worked very hard. And you come to work for the work, which I've missed, but also you're also part of a, a little family. And I missed my work family. Oh, you nice to see you. Today, this Today. is it. Oh, look, a Relax. <laughs> And you brought me cakes, yes. my welcome back cakes. Yeah, I didn't even know you were back. Oh, there's plenty of chocolate in there. Yes, it's got Nutella in them as well. Awesome. <laughs> Dr Humphrey's next patient is 51-year-old Andrew. Hello. Hello. I'm Dr Humphrey. We're going to have a look at your hand. So what have you been doing to yourself? I've been trying to put some firewood. Right, OK. And Using what? Electric chalk. Circular chalk. Circular chalk. And? And I slipped my finger off at yeah, one yeah. and uh, fingers pushed it. So, yes, any any form of um, household uh, DIY tool can cause havoc um, and result in work for us. Could you, could you tell me if I'm hurting you? All right. How much pain are you in? Strapping out of ten. I know, darling. I'm sorry. Which is my fault. Right. Accidents happen. How much bleeding was there? Well, a lot. A lot, OK. Well, I have a lot. They were a decent amount. Are you ready? Because I'm going to start taking these off your right eye. OK. Yeah. Is it a total amputation or just...? It's not a total amputation, but I think it's his ring finger is a, is a mess. It's a bit ring finger is a mess. Yeah. Having Back in Bay 1, Dr Humphrey is with patient Andrew, who severed his fingers on a circular saw. OK, so what I need to do is just inject a, a little bit of uh, anaesthetic and it'll make the whole finger go numb. Right. All right? Once you've had the first one, you'll know what it feels like, all right? right. It just sharp scratch and then some sting, all right? All right. OK? Yeah. All right, so we're going to do that on each one of these fingers, OK? Yeah. Same again. You're doing really well, Andrew. Stings, isn't it? OK. Right, last one. Perfect. Well done. Okay. It should start to feel a little bit better now. All right, so what we're going to do now, um, I'll just put some wet gauze around here so it doesn't stick. It's starting to feel a bit funny yet? Yeah. It's going to need a little bit of tidying up, put it that way. Andrew will need to be transferred to another hospital for reconstructive surgery. You'll end up having to go across to Sheffield and have it fixed. Right, just pop your hand on that. It feels like I've never been away. Next on Dr Humphrey's long list of patients is 54-year-old Ian, who's a familiar face to the department. 
Right, I'm Dr. Humphrey. What's happened for you to turn up here? You don't uh, look like the sort of guy that would come to hospital without no, no, a good well, reason. He's just like a name to me now. <laughs> um, no, I had a couple of strokes, had a stomach bleed. Right, okay. Through aspirin, but generally speaking, I've got a very, very thick head, very right. dizzy, yeah. very nauseous, and obviously with the strokes, I'm very careful. Sure. So did it come on suddenly, just like that, or? Uh, about nine, ten o'clock. It wasn't headaches as such, but really, really thick head, very dizzy, very. Okay, right, I think probably what we need to do is have a little look at you and uh, see whether you've got any signs to suggest you might be having another little stroke, all right? There is part of your brain that um, affects coordination and movement that can be affected. So what I want you to do now is I want you to watch my finger with your eyes, wherever it goes. Now, would you be able to do that better than that, or is that is that um, you? I'd be able to do it better than that, yes, because right. I'm having to look down because I'm, I'm woozy. Right, OK, so that's yeah. not quite normal. OK, pop yourself on the side. Right, we want to check your blood pressure again, don't we? All right, well, that's probably better than my blood pressure. <laughs> 3 hours 78. <laughs> it's my calming influence, you see. Right, OK, so I don't think we're going to get too concerned about the level of your blood pressure. I'll speak to the stroke nurse on call. I'll have to be guided by what they say, all right? We'll, uh, we'll get, uh, get you sorted out with some investigations to find out whether you've had another little stroke or not. Right, I'll come back and tell you what uh, we're doing once I've spoken to the stroke nurse, all right? All right, yeah. OK. Yeah. All right, so can I tell you about three? Yes. Yeah. He's going for a CT head, and then I presume that the stroke team are going to review that on the ward. Right, so I can go CT. CT, and then I presume he can go up to the ward after that, yeah. With patient Ian on his way to the stroke ward, Dr Humphrey is able to catch up with team news. Hi, you okay? Yeah, oh, a good result of uh, Arsenal on the weekend. Yeah, so the bad result for Tottenham. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was there. I saw it all unfold. He's a big Tottenham fan, um, so he had a good bit of banter when we played, and obviously Arsenal came out on top. I've been a Tottenham fan for about 45 years, and I can tell you now, you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. I didn't want to gloat too much just before the game, just in case we didn't win. But yeah, it's Arsenal till I die. <laughs> Dr Humphrey's next patient is 88-year-old Ronnie, who's been brought into casualty by ambulance. Yeah. Now, just looking at you, your breathing's not right, is it? No. Oh. OK. I need to know whether you were a minor once upon a time. <laughs> hmm? I've been not with a few years. Right, were you, in the, were you on the coal face? Uh, I, at time. Right, OK. Did you ever get any compensation for your chest? No. no. You did. We see a lot of minors, and... Again, mining is an is a occupation where you had to work as a team. You were brothers down the pit. And that, uh, that ethic, that hard-working, you know, Yorkshire grits... Just turn your head to the side for me a little bit. I think comes across in, in the way that these patients talk to you or have this sort of very stoical attitude. So how old are you now? Uh, I'm 88. 88, right, OK. And that sometimes shows through in, in the strength of character that these patients have. Right, just breathe in. OK, relax. And again. OK, breathe in. OK. I don't think you're well enough to be at home, you know. Well, you know, if you were my dad, I'd be telling you that you needed to be in hospital well, to get this fluid off your lungs, really. Well, I know it's boring and not very exciting, but... Well, you're not going to be able to manage at home because you won't be able to walk to the toilet or do anything at the moment the way you are. All right? Yeah. OK? Yeah. So you're happy to come into the hospital? Yeah. Right, let's get you around for a chest x-ray and see how much fluid's on your lungs and uh, we'll get, give you, start giving you some treatments, all right? Another busy day at Barnsley Casualty is coming to a close. And it's also the end of Dr Humphrey's first shift for two months. And it's clear he's been missed. So I looked down and my, my leg wasn't like that, but I thought, I tried, so I tried to put weight through it, I thought, no, 
there's definitely something gone. Oh, no. So I went up there and CT, fractured acetabulum, crack all the way up oh, here. I haven't seen you for a while. Yeah, I've been off for eight weeks. In fact, they gave me a no for three months. He said, oh, you won't be back at work for three months. That just shows what difference yeah, yeah. it is if you're fit and you've got yeah. the right Yeah, motivated. Mindset. You've got to be motivated. Determined to put in a full shift, Dr Humphrey is on to his next patient, 72-year-old Peter. How much pain have you got with it? Well, I can't get no more, I don't think. So it's very, very painful right now? Yeah. Right, OK. And have you seen one of the vascular surgeons? Yeah, I do. Scan them and check it. And do you have diabetes? Yeah. Right, Type two. Okay. Type 2 diabetes. When you were working, what was your job? Lorry driver. A lorry driver, OK. Right, so that toe's got some gangrene on, hasn't it? Yeah. Okay. And then that other one on there. Okay. I tell you all the range over long distance probably now. Right. And I mean long distance from Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Syria, Jordan, Yemen, Ireland. Well, from UK? From Barnsley. <laughs> from from Barnsley to Iraq. Yeah. How long did it take for leaving from Barnsley oh, to, to get into Iraq? Baghdad did, would do. Baghdad? Just over two weeks. You say you just can't get a decent Salad sandwich when you're at it, does it? You should eat what you can, will you? We don't look after this problem in this hospital. It's the Vascular Institute in Sheffield. Right, I will ring Sheffield, explain what your foot looks like today, and I would expect them to see you. I've got had them five or three years since. Right, OK. So you've had a midfoot amputation, that's yeah. called, isn't it? Yeah. All five doors off. Yeah, yeah. OK. Well, that's what it's when and I'm... that's what it used to look like, is yeah. it? Yeah. And then it doesn't look like that now, does it? That's the other version when I go to put away. <laughs> so there's, a, there's a, always humour to be had in adversity. Patients in Barnsley, in general, are pretty stoic. They will not go to a doctor unless they really want to. Certainly the, the, the older people in Barnsley. OK. Diabetes is a nasty disease, I'm afraid, isn't it? It is. I'm going to uh, come back and tell you what they're going to do about it, all right? But, I'll um, them off. Oh, get off. Yeah, yeah, I think you'll be a lot more comfortable if they're not there. Yeah. But um, obviously it's their decision, not mine. Right. See you. Have you bandaged many feet? I have. I have. Good lads. Take your hand out first. I've bandaged my hands with you. I'll have to stay with you. We've got a 72-year-old man. Last job of the day for Dr Humphrey is to refer Peter to Sheffield for surgery. <laughs> His toes have got um, gangrene. He's already had a midfoot amputation uh, uh, before, so I think he's heading for another one. Mm. Yeah, you man. Thank you. Okay. Right. So um, the doctor that I spoke to over at the at Sheffield is going to speak to the one of the vascular surgeons, and then hopefully they'll give the approval for you to go across there. Yeah. All right. So what were you taking all the way from Barnsley to Baghdad? Oh, drain pipes, man. Right. Drain okay. Pipes. So construction yeah. materials, right? Okay. Well, I've visited 54 countries in between. Wow. Very good. I was in the air force for oh, yeah? 10 years. Yes. So well, yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, I, I travelled all over the place in the medical. Yeah. But I wasn't a doctor. I left. Uh, the RF to go to medical school. Thank okay. You All right, no problem. Who would have thought you know, that, that there would be lorries going from Barnsley with building materials all the way to Baghdad? I didn't find the actual process of coming back to work too difficult. The um, not being able to sit at home and, <laughs> and relax and watch daytime television or the cycling was a bit of a shame. Hello, Barnsley Emergency Department. OK, one of us will meet you at the door. The latest patient to arrive is 56-year-old Phil, who's come in with chest pain. Phil has a pre-existing rare and dangerous condition known as aortic dissection, which is a tear in the wall of the major artery from the heart. He's arrived with his partner, Sally. They're seen straight away by Dr Humphrey and Sister Bonita Wainwright. So you've had a dissection that is normally treated medically, that type B? Yes. OK. And then what's happened today for you to end up coming here in an ambulance? I've been doing decorating and I've overdone it. And Actually. what happened to make you realise that you'd done too much of it? I did all sorts of bits and pieces, mainly rolling around on the floor screaming in agony. Did you feel fainter today after decorating? Because you look a little bit pale, don't you? Yes. Aortic dissection is potentially fatal. 
so asking Phil key questions helps Dr Humphrey assess if the tear has worsened and how severe the risk could be. Did you feel anything inside your chest, you know, like a tearing sensation? No. Did you feel the tearing sensation the very first, when you had your dissection? No, when I, when I had the dissection, it was transferred pain and it was... Right into your middle of your back? back. Yes. All all, all, all yeah, all the way down. down. We will have to transfer you if, if, it's, if it's split further. You live in Barnsley somewhere. I'm 50-50. We have Chera House in Barnsley. He works in Essex. So your blood pressure in one arm is 20 lower than the other? Wow. OK. With the dissection, that's the sort of thing that you, you measure, OK? Yeah. So, we can't do anything until we know what state your aorta's in, OK? OK. Right, I'm going to organise this scan for you. Okay. And um, we'll uh, assess what you've got going on in your chest. Adam has just arrived with a dislocated shoulder. Dr Humphrey heads to see him, but it's not the first time they've met. I recognise you. How many times is this now? No, I've done it about 30 odd times. You're... That's you're... OK, we better get this fixed then. Comes out when it wants to, do you know what I mean? I've done it turning back tap before, like, putting my jumper on. Bit of pentarox, slime down there and see if we can pop it back in. I like the conditions where if you do something, it instantly relieves the pain. He's your previous, that guy. We've done it before, he knows what's coming. Give me anything that I can put back into joint or um, get my teeth into. In the hub, Phil is being transferred to an acute dependency cubicle. Overexertion at home has put stress on his life-threatening heart condition. While he waits for a CT scan, Dr Humphrey gives Sister Benita a crash course in aortic dissection. He's got a type B dissection. If it extends back down here, then that's an emergency and he'll have to go and have a surgery to fix it. So that's why we need to know what, what the state of his aorta is. I like the ability to be able to, to see a sprained ankle one minute and then deal with someone with a complex cardiac condition the next. Every day is a learning day. Who wants to deal with something interesting? You want to deal with something interesting? Right. This, this man in here has got a type B dissection, diagnosed 10 weeks ago. And I need someone to uh, take him on. He uh, may need to go to Sheffield. He lives 50-50 in Essex and Barnsley. You know what Towie is? No. Don't you? You know what Towie is, don't you? Uh, yeah. Good. The only way is Essex. <laughs> In cubicle two, Dr Humphrey is ready to try to reset Adam's dislocated shoulder. Try using that. Put your finger over and take some really deep breaths. All right? Uh, uh... Really deep breaths. I'm not going to do anything until you're relaxed. At the moment, you're not relaxed at all. You will never, ever reduce a joint unless the patient is relaxed. Relax, uh... relax your arm, relax your arm. I'm just lifting it up, that's all I'm doing. And you can either make someone relax by talking to them and trying to talk them down, or you can chemically relax them. Right, see all these muscles around here? You need to start relaxing them, OK? Everything. Good, that's more like it. Uh, just try and relax. Relax, uh, uh, relax, relax. Really big breath. Like Keep going. It doesn't... Make my mouth dry that time. Big breath. Uh, right. where, where do you want it? You want uh, it like that? Where, 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 where? If you're talking, you're not taking breaths in through there. The patients that we see with the recurrent shoulder dislocations, they will understand what's coming. They know that it's there's going to be a very sharp bit of pain as the, the shoulder pops back in. That's not the window for me. Right, rest your arm in your, in your groin there. Once they've had the sedation, they're very reluctant to try without it. <laughs> right. You're not going to let me do this, are you? No, because it's proper, proper hurting me. Relax. Proper hurting me. Please put it back down, mate. Right? Sit up. Right. I'll take you and put it back in to make you a bit more chemically relaxed. In recess, the team are trying to set up to fix it. You're going to have to take all this okay, shit off. Just take yeah? this off. Just watch your language. See what's going on. Patients can be very challenging. Sometimes they're extremely agitated, and you have to use your experience to understand uh, the best way of dealing with that. 
before you start taking that left side up, okay? Just go and lift it over the canyon. Just hold, just hold as you are. You're all right. Come on. Let's do that for us again. Uh, uh, uh. This is just the mask coming on for the oxygen, OK? So we're going to start giving the medications to first off to relax you and then get you off to sleep, OK? So the first one is like a couple of good stiff drinks, all right? I have been shouted at, sworn at over my career. And at the time, it's, it's, it's intimidating and, it, and it's stressful. But it comes with the territory, and we have to have strategies for dealing with them. And I think, on the whole, we, we do. One of the latest patients to be brought in by paramedics is 89-year-old Margaret, who's had a fall at home. Dr Humphrey has come to assess her in cubicle five. OK, so this morning, you've had a funny do. You've bashed your head your face. You obviously you were unconscious for a while. Is that right? Yeah. I'm okay. so told. You cannot be a doctor without developing a rapport, a, a relationship with a patient. I think it puts them at ease. You're 89, aren't you? You don't look 89, you look about 79. Who called the ambulance for you? I don't know. You don't know, right. Okay. Don't know. When was the last time that this happened? About a week ago. And what did you do about it? Well, I just go down and I must be out for quite a while. Yeah. But when I come round, I get up and I carry on. You yeah, just carry on. So, do you live. Put myself off for being stupid. <laughs> okay. They're not just a body in front of you with a, a condition, they're a person with a life and a family and children and grandchildren. When was the last time that you saw your family doctor about anything? I have no idea. <laughs> OK. So... Because I always think I'm making the fuss about nothing. Do you? Right, OK, you right. One of the typical Barnsley folk, aren't you? So, have you got anybody that helps you in your home? I didn't have, because I've got to get somebody now, I'm told. So you're very independent? Very. Right, OK. If you can find out a little bit about more about them, then actually treating them and talking to them about their illness or their condition becomes a lot easier. It's not all just medicine, medicine, medicine. It's an art, it's a, it's a craft. I'm a little bit worried about your heart just slowing down too much and then you falling over. You do a lot of falling, don't you? You do. Dr Humphrey is trying to find out more about Margaret's fall. Let's find out who called the ambulance for you. I need to do a neighbour, I suppose. Well, it says that you've got a carer that found you sat up against the bed. I've got a carer. Mm. That's news. Is it? Mm -hmm. OK. Have you heard anything else apart from your head, your face? I don't think so. OK, let's have a little look. What about your, your elbows? A few little odd marks there, haven't you? Just turn your head to the side and tell me if it hurts. Yeah, yeah. OK, let me have a little look at that. It is quite difficult at times to to deal with patients who you're not quite sure what's happening. And you really have to widen your choice of investigations to take into account things that may not be apparent to you. You look like you were ready to go to bed when you fell. I've no idea. I don't know what I'm doing half the time anyway. I think we're going to need to do this scan of your head. And then you're going to need a few other tests, I think, to make sure that you're OK. And I'm a little bit concerned that you're not keeping up with things, so we'll need to check through that as well, all right? Did you want a drink and some toast or something like that? Yeah, nice. Right, I'll get a nurse to come and sort that out Thank for you. you. Uh, the lady in cubicle five is going to need admitting. I think she's a little bit confused. She's had unprovoked collapses, so okay. she's got a cardiac red flag. Back in cubicle five, Dr Humphrey's keeping a close eye on Margaret. And can you remember what my job is? You're a doctor, aren't you? Yeah, I try to be, yes. Yeah. OK. I'm just going to move your drink across, OK? Did you want to sit up a little bit or are you OK? Right, you're going to be able to manage, OK? Yes, thank you. If you need anything, you just press that button, OK? Right. 
Dr Humphrey has asked Dr Jamie Pimenta from the frailty unit to come and see her. She's been found on the floor by a carer. She told me she had no carers and she did, did everything herself, but she's got three carers. And you would, you would not think that she's particularly confused if you went to talk to her. Yeah. You just, when, it's when you start actually Boy, digging in, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll go say hello. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Um, How are you, Margaret? Yeah? What's happened? They said you had a little tumble. Well, they just seem to vanish to like... The legs just vanished, do they? All oh, right. Does it feel like you get a fuzzy head or dizzy or anything like that? You feel like passing out? Yeah, that can be to do with your blood pressure not coming up quick enough. So that might mean we have to have a look at your medications and things. But it can, it can, it's, it's often not a problem that happens until we get a little bit older. And then sometimes we need to, I know, I know. Following his assessment, Dr. Pimenta transfers Margaret to the frailty unit for further observation before she's able to return home. Back in recess, Dr. Buick's booked Adam in for an X-ray. But Adam has other ideas. Please come and take this out of me, please. So much happened, I need to... to I'll take it. I'll take it off. All right, let me say you take it out, will you? Yeah. I'm okay. just going to get Doctor to have a quick word with me. If he's happy for you to what? go, I'm happy. Can I put the jumper on, Adam? Just one second. Please. please. No, you're, te you're telling me. I I've done it thousands of times, look. I'm only putting my jumper on. I know, but you need to let the doctor come, because you need to have... Look, you're going to rip this out your arm. I'm not going to rip that out of me. I'm so you need to be careful. Sometimes uh, you will see a patient and you will formulate a management plan and they'll tell you that they accept your advice but they're not going to take it. So it's back in, yeah, it's back in yeah. but you're at risk of popping it out again, that's why it's in the sling. Yeah, I know I'm just going to put my jumpers on now. now. So, but what I'm saying is... If... Yes, where are you? I'm on my way out walking out of them doors in a minute, just stick it down with that love. So what I was saying, just have a listen. I am, I am, I am. Is that you've, all the ligaments around there will be yeah, much looser, so you're at risk if you're moving it. Hang on, hang on, you're not listening, you're not listening. Just let me finish my sentence and then just let me finish my sentence. So what I'm saying is, normally you keep it completely still to stop it coming out again. That's why we normally x-ray it and that's why I'd keep it still. You got me out? Do you feel like he's listening? No. Yeah, yeah, I've just, I've just come out. I often will say to patients, you've come here to see a doctor, and if you don't want to listen to that advice, then that's your choice. Patients have the right to refuse treatment. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Appreciate you. Fine. Take care. Thanks for that extra. Thank you. It's just wasting your time anyway, mate. Okay, not to worry. With Adam's shoulder back in place again, he heads home, with everyone hoping it will hold in place this time. Tonight's shift is Dr Humphrey. Right, so those that are going home, just make sure you've handed over your patients and those that are staying, there were about five or six ambulances outside when I cycled in, so might get a little bit busy. OK, carry on. And working alongside him, looking after the nurses, is Sister Benita. Good evening. You OK? Yes. Good. Julian's a nightmare. <laughs> Yeah, just to let you know, I'm moving the guy in Key yep. 5 into recess. OK, carry on. Who is it? Who is it? <laughs> I get a lot of little digs and jibes. Then you wonder why I lose my temper. Who's that? Who's that? I think mainly to pass the time, but... <laughs> oh, bugger off. Vanessa is experienced in managing busy departments because practically all her shifts are busy. When I see that she's actually coordinating, then I prepare myself for what's coming next. <laughs> With the major trauma in recess... Tell him I ain't got time now, I'll do it in a bit. Why won't this print? Oh, for goodness sake. The staffing numbers in the rest of the department are depleted, putting a massive strain on the team. All right. OK, yeah. All right, then, thank you. Bye. Right, we've got no male surgical beds now. Zilch. There's quite a few waiting now. What time did you start? Me. Seven. <laughs> <laughs> what time did it all go wrong? What time did I Seven. walk through the door? <laughs> Seven. <laughs> yeah. Whereabouts is he now going to see him first? In the hub. Yeah. Ta
Dr Humphrey has got a sixth sense about his next patient. Oh, I thought I could smell a cyclist. Let's have a little look. Fellow biking fanatic Gary has come to casualty following a crash. Tell me about this accident. I was riding down a very, very steep hill with a bend at the bottom. Yeah. And overshot it down the track. So yeah. did you over? Did you just overcook it? I was just going too fast. I right. Think. You don't look like you've gone no, down no, on this side. I didn't come off because yeah. Um, the hill was too. I knew I wasn't going to make the hill. Yeah, so yeah. So I took a, a track instead. Right. And there was a sort of metal barred gate that took your chin uh, out. That's what I, I think. Right. Okay. So you stayed on the bike. I stayed on the bike. Good man. I've treated lots of cyclists and they recover really well. Yes, yeah, so I do love the banter, the chit chat. Unfortunately, I've got a Dura Ace wheel that's got a lot of damage. Oh, that hurts. Oh, Just no. <laughs> What's the worst you've done then? If I catch it. All oh, right, do you want me to tell you? OK, the worst things I've done, I had a fractured neck of femur, which is um, in Italy. I was doing the Milan San Remo Gran Fondo, fell off, was in hospital in Italy and having an operation. Just before Christmas, I fractured my uh, hip socket, my sit bone, and uh, a bit of my pelvis as well. I've got a season ticket to the physio department. I know all the physios by their first name. And um, I think the staff have a lot of fun at my expense. I've been advised to use tricycles, hip protectors, um, take up tiddlywinks. <laughs> OK. Let's just have a little look. This is a mere scratch compared to that, I'm afraid. So we're going to need to put some stitches in that. That'll take two minutes. Let's have a look at these teeth. Oh, yeah, OK. Oh, yeah. Right, you have to see a dentist yeah. about that. Your lip, I think we'll probably just leave that alone. Okay. It's not looking too bad. So the main thing is get that sorted out, give it a good clean, get the get the Yorkshire grit out of it. Let's have you next door and we'll uh, we'll uh, clean all this up and uh, make it better for you. So the gap will be from six to eight. Uh, there'll be a two-hour gap from six while eight in the morning. There'll be only two doctors yeah, on. There'll only be eight. two on. Uh, Doctor Wait now is two hours and six. Yeah, I mean, we've had a massive influx over the past couple of hours. In treatment bay three, Dr Humphrey is patching up fellow cycling enthusiast, Gary. Right then, let's get this show on the road. After he crashed head on into a metal post while out cycling. Right, so what we're going to do is we're going to make it nice and numb, then I'm going to give it a good clean, and then. Okay. That's it. I'll sort of put that round you. Right, so first things first, I'm going to put this anaesthetic in. Oh, a little scratch then. Sort out stings. Yeah, okay. So the stinging is the worst bit. But for someone who's had multiple injuries, this is nothing. Yeah, that should be starting to get numb now. Right. Scrubbing time. I do love the practical aspect of my job a lot. Oh, it's not a toothbrush you're using. It is a toothbrush I'm using. <laughs> I find it's the best way of getting into these wounds on the face. You never know what's lurking in here. I thought your people subcontracted the suture in these days. What, to nurses? Well, cyclists always get preferential treatment. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. If there's a chance to do it, then um, I'll sneak the patient in and do it myself. Don't tell anybody else that, will you? <laughs> Last one, I think, for you. Right, so I've put four stitches in, OK? And these stitches need to come out in about a week's time. Your looks have been restored. <laughs> You're a miracle worker. <laughs> Which well, year? Been tra I've been trained in plastic <laughs> surgery. <laughs> Can you do 1982 for me? <laughs> yeah, that was a great year, wasn't it? Right, you're finished. Thank you very much. Sir. No problem. <laughs> OK. As well as treating patients, Dr Humphrey is also in charge of the whole department. That one looks a little bit crushed. That oh, that's the one I was talking about. Yeah. Just... What I would do is I'd try and get up and walk her and see what she can do. Yeah. As a leader, as a coordinator, you, you're almost like the conductor of an orchestra. So we need to just um, replace his catheter, do we? Abscess. Oh, yeah, the surgeons are going to see him. Oh, he's back. My, my, my guy was waving at me. Essentially, if there are any problems, that we start targeting resources to ensure that we address the problems that are coming up. Well, let's have a look at it. Yes? No? Maybe? 
it yet. We've just been inundated last hour. If you need anything, let me know. Yep. Okay, you know where I am. All right. At Barnsley Hospital, the casualty team are battling to keep on top of the large numbers of patients coming into the department. It is hard work. Over a 12-hour stint sometimes is, is a lot to take on when you consider how many patients come through those doors. Want a visa card? No. <laughs> have, you, have you got his visa card? <laughs> <laughs> Honest to God. So, yeah, the jokes keeps you just normal, like. <laughs> You're living up to your reputation. I d I d I'm, I'm past caring now. <laughs> <laughs> so we've just been slammed the last two hours, haven't we, by, what's that, 25, 20 patients. So we've had 45 patients book in the last two hours. So it'll take us at least a couple of hours to get on top of that. And, um, and the wait's crept up slightly now yeah. to three hours. Yeah, go ahead. Paramedics call ahead about a critical case. CPR. They're rushing in a young man who has stopped breathing. Sister Bonita Wainwright prepares rhesus so the team can begin life-saving treatment immediately. Okay, fine. Team rhesus then. How long? Thanks, bye. It's a sad day, isn't it? Consultant Dr. Julian Humphrey will be leading the team. The paramedic, before you go, come and hand over to me and uh, consult the nieces so we know what exactly what's been going on here. The young man has life threatening injuries from trying to hang himself. So, so uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, found by found in the no, bathroom. In the bathroom. So, this is more likely to be suffocation, isn't it, rather than. Uh, yeah. Which, yeah, okay. The first thing you need to do is, is try and resuscitate them. And you can't, you can't panic. Anaesthetists have taken control of his breathing, and he's been placed on life support. Didn't come in blue. Clearly had a an episode of hypoxia. The team are now concerned that his brain may have been starved of oxygen. Right. I'll go and order some blood tests. Dr. Humphrey needs to take blood from an artery to assess the oxygen levels in his body. If you can find a femoral artery here and take a 10 mil uh, vial of blood, that would be good. All right. The blood results reveal he needs oxygen. But to give it to him safely, he must be sedated. Can I have some more midazolam drawn up, just in case we need it? Just uh, five milligrams will do. Ten smell. milligrams, ten mil. Do you need anything else, Julian? It does affect people. People that work on patients that have harmed themselves. One of the things you've got to do is, is put all the emotional side apart and face the medical problem that you're dealing with. Right. The patient has been given oxygen and is stable, but he urgently requires a CT scan to assess if he has any injuries to his neck or any brain damage. I, I don't take my work home, um, and I have strategies that I've evolved over the years to, um, to cope with that, because if you took all that home, it would it would keep you up all night. Hello, emergency department. Yep. Yeah. yeah, how old? Paramedics are rushing a 94-year-old woman into rhesus. Doris has come in with a gaping wound on her leg. Consultant Dr. Julian Humphrey wants to find out more from healthcare assistant Jess French. Jess, what's happening here then? So, this lady's come in. Last night she um, caught a leg on the stairlift as she's going oh. to bed. 
managed fine, yeah. went to bed, slept, really comfortable, um, got up, started mobilising yeah. and pressures just split for like, right. bless her. So she uh, had a spurter this morning, made All a right. rattle, mess of the bed sheets um, and then obviously yes arrived, Okay. brought to us. Oh, I can hear him getting the pinnies on, the mean business. Hey. They're getting the pinnies on, the mean business. <laughs> no messing. <laughs> Do I get one, guys? The casualty team are expecting a lot of blood, so they've put on aprons in readiness. Leading her care is consultant Dr John Rayner. So, so we'll have a quick look now, just to take the bandage down, and we'll, we'll see what we can see. All right. Doris's daughter Sheila and son Ray are by her side. When it was bleeding before, was it literally hitting the ceiling bleeding? No. When I actually got there, they got, a, they got a towel on it. Yeah. When I moved the towel, yeah. I asked for permission, I took a photo so I yeah. could see it. Yeah. And then it filled just started. Up. It filled up and then it started squirting. Now then, my love, yeah, sorry, is it really, really sore? Yeah. It's sore when you're touching it. When you're sorry. touching it. Squeeze my hand. <laughs> Some patients will come in with a massive, great big towel and blood all, all over the place, and then you'll take it off, and then there'll be the most minuscule little thing on their finger that has just bled a lot. Sometimes you'll take the towel off, and there'll be half a finger missing or a few fingers missing, and it'll be, oh, right, OK. There's a big bruise, isn't there? What is it? Your stair lift on your stairs? Eh? Was it on your stair lift on your stairs? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've caught it when I'm getting on. To go up? To go up, because, you know, I've... Yeah. When when patients come with really significant injuries and the nurses see that it's a really significant injury, they will then look straight at you, and if you're going, then that really isn't going to help the situation. You can be internally shocked, but you shouldn't actually show it. So don't don't register it. Until I started walking about this morning. Then Pressure, I think. It's isn't it? I'm colourful, if no else. I'll give that. Oh, I don't think I have. Well, no, if you're going to do it, do it right, Ed. Yeah, yeah, you no, know, stop bleeding, which is good. But well, you've got a massive blood clot, which is less good. All right, because in the grand scheme of these wounds, this is probably the worst one I've ever seen. But there are some nurses who, who don't like certain things like there are doctors who don't like eyes and there's some doctors who don't like toes. The front line of Barnsley Hospital is its casualty department and heading the charge today is Dr Humphrey. You need some fluid therapy first and uh, gas and stuff like that. OK. There's a place for everybody in the department, whether you're an extrovert or an introvert or you're in between. You're part of the team and we, we all know what we need to do. It's an unexplained collapse and it's got red flags all over it, OK? Yeah. A lot of it's unpredictable, but that's what makes up the variety of what we do. Managing the unpredictability with Dr Humphrey is Sister Jane. Hi, lovey, it's Jane downstairs in A&E. &E. Hey, love, I've got a lady for you. With two porters down, the department is at risk of grinding to a halt. The porters are, are an essential part of what we do. Without them, we couldn't function. While patients waiting to be admitted are coming to a standstill, the ambulances keep arriving. Paramedics have brought in a patient Dr Humphrey should recognise. For eight years, Ken worked at Barnsley Hospital as a security guard. Earlier this year, he had a stroke and his wife Valerie is concerned that it may have happened again. Are you all right? I am, you I'm not too bad, but you're not so good, are you? It's way worse than now. I've had. Uh, all right. You, oh, it's, it's, you're not going to be able to. Move me. Move, move me. You're not going to be able to tell me at the moment because no. your speech isn't quite right. Let me no, let me hear bad. what you guys got to say. Yeah, but it just went well tonight. We didn't know if we were in stroking or a seizure or were children. Just. So when did you stop being security here? 2012. I thought I'd seen you around, <laughs> and that's why. I'm amazing coming into later. We try and make sure that we give people the best treatment we can. You know, when it's staff, they're a little bit like your own family. This has always been weak, hasn't it? And you make sure that they're, they're treated with the respect that they've, they've earned and deserve, really. So you had a stroke earlier in the year, yeah. and did it take 
this arm yeah, this, and your leg. Yeah, that one. Right. And how much of a recovery have you made from that well, stroke? Well, it's, it's, everything, it was, everything, there's an effort, it's all right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I know this that. is, it, 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 it doesn't open itself, all right, make, okay. Make more. A stroke can affect your speech because you cannot say the right words or the words that you're using are the wrong type of words. You can understand what people are saying to you, but you can't reply, and that is, it must be incredibly uh, distressing. What's this called? Scan. What's ben. Ben. A pen, that's right. OK, yes. yes. And what do you do with it? That's when you put it forward and that there. Yes, what do you do with it? What's it called? Calvator is what they call it. Right, OK, all right. The strokes that affect speech are really, really disabling for patients and really quite frightening and um, anxiety provoking. Um, what's this? That's, that's a bank now, what we are going to need to do is you're going to need to go and have another scan of your brain, uh -huh. OK? Because you may have had a little uh, bit more of a stroke, and that's why things are not quite right, OK? Yeah. And when the alarm brain goes in... Yeah, I'm going to have a little bit of a difficulty understanding you at the moment, but, know, you know... I can't tell. Yeah, 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 all right. <laughs> just try and relax. If Ken has had another stroke, there's just a four-hour window in which effective treatment can be given. Do you want to get a porter to take him round to uh, CT when uh, yeah. you've done whatever you need to do? While Ken is taken to CT as a priority, Dr Humphrey phones ahead. Julian Humphrey here. One of our old security guards has come in with a... He's had a stroke before, but he's come in with possibly an extension of his stroke. He's got a dis expressive dysphasia. See you later. Bye. As Dr Humphrey waits for the scan results, he checks in on Ken. OK, we'll see what your scan shows. <laughs> I'll try and work out what you're saying by the time you leave. No promises, though. Thank you. It's a very frustrating thing to have an expressive dysphasia like that, where you can't... You know what you want to say, but it's all coming out as gibberish. Ken's scan revealed he had suffered a seizure, a result of his previous stroke. After being monitored for a few hours, he was able to return home. He continues to suffer with speech difficulties and he's been supported by his family. And for one member of staff, going the distance is in their blood. Nice to run home. You run home? Yeah, it was about two, yeah, two and a half miles. How old were you when you ran home? 10. House. Council really house. No, I just I used to love running. I was just cra a, tra a crazy kid. I was a crazy kid. Dr. Humphrey's next stop is the minor injuries unit. He thinks he has a solution to 90 year old Bernard's bleeding finger. Are you going to do well on this? Uh, uh, Cauterise it there. Yeah. Um, can you remember the barbers used to have a thing called a styptic pencil? I'm not done, Jim. <laughs> well, that's, this is the same thing, and it will just burn that and stop it bleeding. Oh, okay. Yeah, it might be a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit pet sore, all right, when I do it. Right, tell me if this is painful, all right? That's better, isn't it, straight away? I think that'll do, won't it? I think it was just bleeding from there. Did you hear that? I can hear I heard you, yeah. OK. It was just bleeding from there. We'll, we'll try that. Fine. All good. It certainly stings. Yes. Well, you look very healthy for 90, I must say. Oh, what's the health <laughs> Looking healthy and feeling healthy is a different thing altogether. All right. Well, what's your secret? What's your secret of old age? <laughs> Living. <laughs> or breathing. It's always helps, doesn't it? It's a snooker, isn't it? Yeah. A bit of snooker. Yeah. But only on a Friday. Only on a Friday. 
Fingers see crossed ya. that that's where it goes now. So we still want to see you tomorrow. I'm going to go to handover, I think. Oh, I've got five minutes. Charlotte. As the shift comes to a close, the team begin to head off. It's been another challenging 12 hours in Barnsley Casualty with some very ill patients. The human body definitely surprises me in what it can take, what it can't take. It's a very resilient thing and the personalities that we come across, there's a lot of resilience in people from Barnsley. They're a very impressive group of people.